According to his critics, Edward Snowden is responsible for the biggest leak of American and British secret intelligence documents in history, mainly from America's National Security Agency, the NSA. To others, he's a hero who has brought to public attention the vast scale of surveillance we are all potentially under. I'm Peter Taylor, and I've been covering intelligence and security matters for the BBC for 35 years. I thought the chances of interviewing Edward Snowden were slim, but it was worth trying. It took me three months to arrange a meeting, working through intermediaries and often using encrypted communications. During this time, I never spoke to Edward Snowden directly. I was finally told to go to Moscow, check into a hotel, text my room number, and then he would come and knock on my door. And sure enough, to my enormous relief, he did. In this BBC World Service programme, you can hear our conversation. My first question was, why did you do what you did? When I was sitting at my desk at the NSA, working with tools of mass surveillance every day, I saw that the public statements of our government were inconsistent with the reality of what was actually happening to everybody in the world. And we're not talking about terrorist suspects. All of our communications were being intercepted all of the time in the absence of any suspicion of wrongdoing. And this was something that was occurring without our knowledge, without our consent, and without any sort of democratic uh, participation from the public. And when I looked at the laws that were on the books, it seemed clear to me that these programs were unlawful. As I began thinking about if there was anything I could do to give the public a chance to decide whether these programs should continue, I thought about the costs, I thought about the risks, um, and it's, it's a big decision. But then I saw the most senior intelligence official in the United States, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, raise his hand and swear to tell the truth on the floor of Congress, on camera, in front of the entire American people. And he was directly asked by a senator who knew that mass surveillance was occurring if the NSA was collecting any records at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. And he said, no, no, sir, they're not, not wittingly. And that was untrue. I had a special level of clearance uh, called PRIV-AC, Privileged Access, where normal people have to request access uh, to this document or that document. I had access to everything by nature of my role. And that included documents from the British government. But it doesn't say a lot for the NSA's security systems if you can simply go off and take all these documents with you. There's an unconfronted challenge uh, in the public debate since uh, the revelations of 2013, which is that we are expected to trust these agencies uh, with complete access to the total details of our lives. And they're expected to trust people like you. That's a trust that you betrayed. But it's actually not a trust that I betrayed, because when you enter into service at the Central Intelligence Agency or the National Security Agency, you're asked to swear an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. If these agencies are engaged in unconstitutional activities, and the courts have sided with me that these activities were unconstitutional, they should not make us swear an oath to stand up and stop such activities when we witness them. I fulfilled the roles and the obligations of my oath in a manner which they did not. I haven't benefited in any way from the disclosure of this information. Moreover, I have never published a single document. I worked with journalists who, in American society at least, are the representatives of the public in determining what the public interest is in understanding certain facts uh, and realities that the government many times would prefer to keep secret. When you decided to make these revelations, did you think about the possible consequences that you might end up in exile, not necessarily in Russia, but that you would be pursued uh, and the United States government is unlikely to call it a day? It's going to pursue you until it gets you. Oh, of course. You must have done. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't think there's anybody who can be in that and situation. And many years in jail. I was more concerned with the consequences for society generally. Would this cause harm? Would anybody uh, face some unnecessary risk as a result? What I thought about exhaustively was how do we make sure that we know what we need to in order to be able to protect ourselves 
and to be able to protect free society against the natural inclinations of secret agencies and bureaucracy uh, as technology continues to advance and they gain more and more power. What is the relationship between the NSA, the National Security Agency in America, and GCHQ, the UK equivalent? The easiest way to conceptualize that relationship is that the GCHQ is, for almost all intents and purposes, a subsidiary of the NSA. Uh, the NSA, more often than not, provides funding. Uh, I believe they provide millions of dollars to the GCHQ's budget every year. They provide technology, they provide tasking and direction as to what they should go after. And in exchange, the GCHQ provides access to communications that are collected in the United Kingdom and at all of the different bases and points of collection that are under the control of the United Kingdom. Around the world? Around the world. Uh, and this includes within the UK. Now, there are a lot of claims made by government that uh, you know, we won't share information on this UK citizen or that UK citizen uh, as a matter of principle. But then we see they also caveat these rules uh, to an extreme degree where they say, well, that doesn't count if it's metadata. You know, that only counts if it's the content of a communication and so on and so forth. But the NSA and GCHQ say, yes, we collect massive, huge amounts of data, but the actual amount of data that we look at in particular is minuscule. That They're not in the business of finding out about everybody. They have particular targets in which they're interested. And their collection methodology means that they can, in the end, identify the people that they're looking for, the terrorists or the criminals or the drug traffickers. But to find out who those targets are, they've got to collect mass data. Well, let's presume that their claims match the reality of what's happening. Let's say that they are collecting all of this information about everybody. They know everything that you do, everywhere you go. But they're not interested. But they're not interested. And they don't read it. And they only use this when it's necessary and proportionate to a serious criminal threat. That sounds like a pretty persuasive claim that they could make to the public and get legislation to support that, right? So why didn't they? Isn't that something that the public should have a say in? But many members of the public, certainly in the UK, would say, yes, GCHQ are doing this, and frankly, I don't care if it helps them identify the bad guys, and I've got nothing to hide because I'm a good guy. Many people would say that. And they wouldn't necessarily be wrong, and this is something that people can debate. But the question that's raised by that is, is it true? Are these programs effective? Do they keep us safe? We've had mass surveillance in the United States for more than 10 years now. The White House appointed two investigatory panels, and they found that these programs were not effective in stopping terrorist attacks. The value that these programs have is for intelligence gathering. The problem is these programs are justified to the public as anti-terrorism programs. They do have a very strong value in the context of intelligence gathering, but that's not the same as saying this is a public safety program. Another Snowden document, codenamed PRISM, revealed the relationship between the NSA and the American-based social media companies like Google, Facebook and Yahoo!, under PRISM, the companies were legally obliged to give the NSA direct access to whatever information they required. PRISM's purpose was to track foreign terrorists living outside the USA. PRISM revealed that the government would go to this secret court uh, that would provide these secret orders. It's a rubber stamp court that never says no. And they would say, we want to have access to this individual's communications or that individual's communications without going through the typical legal process of an open court. Nobody knew this was going on. And nobody knew that this was going on. What information can the agencies get from this, a smartphone? Who you call, what you've texted, the things you've browsed on your phone, the list of your contacts, the places you've been, uh, the wireless networks that your phone is associated with, for example, at your home and your office, so the, the Smurf Suite is a collection of capabilities specifically targeting the iPhone. Dreamy Smurf is the power management tool, which means turning your phone on or off without you knowing. Even if I've turned my phone off? Right. And then we've got Nosy Smurf. What's Nosy Smurf? 
Nosy Smurf is the, the hot miking tool. Hot miking is when you activate the microphone on a telephone as if it were having a call but without anybody dialing a call. So for example, if it's in your pocket, they can turn the microphone on and listen to everything that's going on around you. Even if my phone is switched off? Even if your phone's switched off because they've got the other tools for turning it on. Tracker Smurf, what's Tracker Smurf? Uh, that's a geolocation tool which uh, allows them to follow you with a greater precision than you would get uh, from the typical triangulation of cell phone towers. Do those principles apply to other smartphones? Absolutely. What you want to think about is that a cell phone is a constantly connected location device that has a microphone attached to it. And if you were a surveillance agency, it's sort of a target that's simply too tempting to ignore. Another Snowden document revealed how GCHQ hacked data from a foreign country using a technique known as CNE. Computer network exploitation is basically digital espionage. You're trying to control things that you don't own through digital code, digital weapons, uh, to gain information, intelligence about their operation. One of the documents that uh, you revealed, again marked top secret, is about computer network exploitation. And one section refers to the way, this is a GCHQ document, refers to the way in which GCHQ hacked into or hacked the Cisco router into Pakistan. And it says uh, this affords access to almost any user of the Internet inside Pakistan. Now, how would they do that? So... The way the internet works uh, is you've got your computer on one end and you've got the other person's computer on the other. But in order to make that wire connect from here to here, it's got to go through network operators, network service providers. Now, what the intelligence agencies like to do is they'll hack those network service providers and secretly take ownership of the devices that are uh, affecting traffic. Without the service providers knowing about it. Without the service providers ever knowing about it. And when... In this particular case, Cisco found out. What was Cisco's reaction? Well, the companies will be uh, incredibly angry because what they're doing is they're compromising the trust in the product and services that these companies, which are critical parts of our economy, have with their customers. The question that these companies ask is, who do we work for, our customers or the government? This GCHQ document that shows how GCHQ accessed the Cisco routers was legal, it wasn't illegal, because the document is about seeking authorization for continuation of these kind of programs. So we're not talking about illegalities here. This was quite legal. Sometimes what's scariest is not what the government is doing that's unlawful, but what they're doing that is completely lawful. Now, the danger of these programs is that when you hack a router, you're not monitoring one person. You're monitoring millions of people. The UK Parliament is about to start debating an important new piece of legislation called the Investigatory Powers Bill. What would you say to our legislators when they are considering what they should say and how they should vote? You need to impose a structure of oversight that will allow both members of government and the public to verify that their activities are proper and appropriate at all times, and that those who violate them can be held to account. I think the real question is, who is best positioned to assess the lawfulness of an intrusion into an individual's rights, a minister or a judge? When I look at it, it seems quite clear to me that the courts should be the place to resolve those controversies. On social media, at the moment, there appears to be a standoff between the social media companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the government, the intelligence agencies, say, we need access to the material that you've got because we wish to identify the bad guys. The social media companies, or most of them are saying, but wait a minute, our priority is privacy. Where do you stand on that? It's really a question of free enterprise. Who do companies work for? Do they work for their customers or do they work for governments? And remember, if a company begins accepting requests to break the security of their communications for one government, they have to do it for all of them or they'll be excluded from the markets. 
You mean they have to do it for the Russian government, right. the Chinese government? Precisely. If we say we'll build a back door for the United Kingdom to be able to search for terrorists, the Chinese will immediately come forward and say, if you want to sell your product in China, you have to provide us with the same capability. Do you remember this photograph? Perhaps a reminder of, of happier days? <laughs> That's Michael Hayden, the uh, former director of the NSA and the CIA. General Michael Hayden, who's not one of your biggest fans, says this is the most serious hemorrhaging of American secrets in the history of American espionage, and it set back US intelligence capabilities by years, if not decades. Aren't you a traitor? Michael Hayden is the man who first authorized the warrantless wiretapping of everyone in the United States, which continued for a period of more than 10 years until it was revealed by me, which ended the program and restored a, a level of constitutional protections of everyone in the United States. Now, the question here is who does Michael Hayden serve? I didn't sell information, you know, I didn't benefit from this in any way. Uh, most people would say, you know, living in exile is a big loss. Michael Hayden would say that his job, his role, is to protect the American people, to protect them from harm. And what he's saying is what you have done is the opposite, is that your revelations have seriously damaged the American people. Are you a traitor? Of course not. Uh, the question is, if I was a traitor, who did I betray? I gave all of my information to American journalists and free society generally. Who is the government working for? Are they working for the people or are they working against us? With regard to your future, the former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder has said that now, quotes, a possibility exists for the Justice Department to cut a deal. Is that under consideration? Is that a possibility? We have seen a big change since 2013, where the government denounced me in the harshest terms, said I had blood on my hands. We don't hear that anymore. And as a result, I am increasingly optimistic that the government will reconsider the wisdom of charging whistleblowers in the same way they charge spies. Thinking of your future, would you be prepared to do some kind of deal, some kind of plea bargain? Uh, of course. I've, I've uh, volunteered to go to prison with the government many times. What I won't do is I won't serve as a deterrent to people trying to do the right thing in difficult situations. But you would be prepared to face a jail sentence, would you? Of course. Isn't it ironic that you, a defender of freedom, of civil liberties are here as a result of the hospitality of Russia, whose record on human and civil rights and liberties and privacy won't really withstand scrutiny. I applied for asylum in 21 different countries, uh, all throughout Western Europe and other parts of the world, and all of them tried to avoid giving an answer uh, because they didn't want to say one way or another uh, and risk either alienating their public uh, by punishing people who are working to protect human rights, uh, or to alienate the United States government by taking a public side against them. But I've made it clear uh, that I'm always willing to return home. I would return home tomorrow as long as the government was prepared to be reasonable and protect the interests of our rights and society. And um, how would you describe the government's reasonableness in this case? What would you be looking to from them for you to return? Well, so far they've said they won't torture me, which is a start, I think. Um, but we haven't gotten much further than that. How are you managing in, in Russia? I mean, where's your money coming from? You've got to live, you've got to eat, you've got to clothe yourself. Where's the, where's the money coming from? I've been extremely fortunate. I made an extraordinary amount of money for someone with my qualifications before I left, and I took a everything that I had with me. Uh, but how do you access that money? Well, it was in cash. How much did you bring out with you? Well, I can't say that, because it would probably violate some customs declaration. People seeing what you say and listening to what you say here in Russia will say, now, wait a minute. Here he is, enjoying the hospitality of Russia, of Vladimir Putin. He must have done a deal. There must be a quid pro quo. The FSB wouldn't simply let you stay here without grilling you about what you've done, your secrets. Have you done a deal with the FSB? Of course not. I burned my life to the ground 
to work against surveillance. Why would I suddenly turn around, just because I'm in a different geographical location, and say, yes, now I'm all about surveillance, that's what I'd like to do from now on? It doesn't make sense. But one assumes that the Russians, the FSB, would want to find out all that they could from you about what you did and how you did it. You are a golden capture, a golden asset on their doorstep. That's all public already. Everything, you know, I, I worked for, everything that I knew has already been revealed. It's in the hands of journalists. Uh, I have no further value. Has the Russian intelligence service, the FSB, talked to you? Uh, of course. When I was in the airport, I brought no information with me from Hong Kong. That was left with journalists precisely because I knew that I would be transiting areas where I wouldn't be able to control my person, my effects. But if I gave you my computer, given your capabilities at a computer, couldn't you access the data that you once had but no longer have? Isn't it there no, no, no. on your own personal iCloud or something? <laughs> no, no, no. So this, this information that was provided to journalists, it's stored offline, what's called air-gapped systems. They have no connections to the internet or anything like that, precisely to protect them against this kind of offensive cyber operation and so forth. The only way to protect yourself against that kind of coercion or subversion is to simply not know the answers at all. I know how to keep a secret safe, and I also know when the public needs to know it. When you look at all that has happened, and when you look at your future, which will probably entail a period, perhaps a very long period in jail, do you have any regrets about what you've done? I regret that I didn't come forward sooner. Because the longer you wait with programs like this, the more deeply entrenched they have become and the more difficult they are to reform. I have paid a price, but I'm comfortable with that. And I have to say, I sleep more soundly now than I ever have before. Edward Snowden, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It was witnessing the United States' most senior intelligence official apparently lying to Congress that turned Snowden into a whistleblower. The response by many US lawmakers to his revelations has been to turn against the intelligence agencies that seemingly kept them in the dark. Earlier this year, they voted to curtail bulk collection of Americans' phone records. The attitude of the US state to Snowden is, it seems, somewhat contradictory. Its legal system regards him as a spy and fugitive from justice. But the message from many politicians and ordinary citizens is, thank you for the truth. You've been listening to a BBC World Service programme with me, Peter Taylor, talking to former NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. The producers were Howard Bradburn and Tim Mansell. Thank you.